You're listening to a composition by iconoclastic tenor saxophonist Mark Turner called Jackie's Place. Jackie's Place was released in 2001 on Mark's album Dharma Days, which featured Kurt Rosenwinkel on guitar, Reed Anderson on bass, and drummer Nasheed Waits. Dharma Days was, for me as well as I'm sure for hordes of my peers, seminal in shaping our approach to ensemble playing. Mark and Kurt had a thing. They sounded like a band, and consequently, I'm sure there was a group in every major city trying to sound exactly like them. Mine was called Eponymous, and we played Jackie's Place all over Champaign-Urbana, Illinois in 2008 and 2009. After thoroughly dismantling the innards of this great tune, we're then also going to tear apart one of my favorite Mark Turner solos from the title track of the Fly Trio's 2008 album, Sky and Country. This solo is so rigorously constructed that it sounds like it could have been composed ahead of time. Not a single note is misplaced. There is no filler. It has a unique structure and it draws on extremely limited motivic ideas. In that sense, on paper and out of context, it is virtually indistinguishable from Mark's composed melody on Jackie's Place. The thing is, with Mark Turner, the line between composer and improviser is substantially blurred. And I've been thinking about this idea of improvising like a composer and its converse composing improvisationally ever since an extremely deep conversation with Leo Sidrin on his Third Story podcast. I talk about Jim McNeely too much, so I'm gonna, this is my last time, but one of the things he taught me was like sitting down at the piano and improvising like a composer. I love this idea. I want you to talk about this a little more. I, I, I think about this a lot, about where improvisation and composition meet. I think it's like an under-discussed idea. I agree, but it would be really hard for me to try to explain what improvising like a composer might mean. Since this is a tough idea to explain, maybe the best way to understand what it means to improvise compositionally would be to look at an example. And in my mind, there is no more clear example of what I'm talking about than Mark Turner. This is Score Study with me, Brian Kroc. Meet Kevin Sun, tenor saxophonist, composer, writer, really smart mother as I began to ruminate on Mark Turner's musical world, I consulted Kevin's foreword to Jeff McGregor's book of Mark Turner transcriptions. As with everything Kevin writes, I found that essay so valuable that I decided to get Kevin on Zoom for a chat about Mark. The reason I thought of you, obviously, is because you wrote that foreword for the book, which is incredibly written, by the way. Um, oh, thanks. Jeff McGregor transcribed all the solos and um, also interviewed Mark extensively for the book. It was his project and he reached out to me. I think he saw um, a piece I'd written, Music and Literature, a couple years ago about Mark Turner. And of course, I'm a huge fan. That's kind of why I wrote that original piece in the first place. I chose to look at Jackie's Place for this video for a few reasons. One, I just really like the tune a lot. But secondly, it represents the apex of a certain style of jazz in the aughts that became extremely influential to subsequent generations. I've seen Mark refer to this music as modern mainstream jazz in an interview with Ben Ratliff, and that's an apt enough description. This era was characterized by complexity, odd time signatures galore, dense dissonant harmonies, and through composed forms abounded. It's sort of like a pinnacle of a way of writing that I think a lot of people, myself included, have done badly, which is like very exciting, vibrant, rich, ambiguous, mysterious colors in a sequence that don't necessarily have a sort of backbone of structure or functionality, whereas this piece, you know, does. And there's a third reason I chose to look at Jackie's place, because after the release of Dharma Days, Mark Turner didn't release another album as a leader for 13 years. Thus, a lot of us tend to look at this album as something of a definitive statement on that era of Mark's music. One bar. One, two, three, four. Jackie's Place begins by constructing the eight bar groove that comprises the majority of the composition. First, Nasheed Wade sets up the rhythmic pattern with a purposefully oblique, albeit very groovy, 
drum intro. Then an ostinato bass figure is introduced, which will see no variation during both the head and the solos. The pitches of this bass line seem to have been constructed with variety in Mark's subconscious. Within this eight measure vamp, six of the bars have unique intervals. The tritone in measure one is the only interval that gets repeated in measure seven and eight, and we will soon see a lot more tritones further on in the composition. On the third repetition, Kurt Rosenwinkel's guitar clearly delineates the harmony, which, like the bass figure, is comprised of specific voicings which will remain consistent throughout the song. Let's take a closer look at these voicings. All but one contain a major second contained within either a major or a minor seventh. Or some inversion of that shape. This is a gorgeously ambiguous shape. All 12 chromatic pitches are options for bass notes, depending on how much tension you would like to create. Then the real trick is to create a sequence of chord changes that provide a satisfying arc of tension and release. As Kevin mentioned to me, there are tons of examples of bad compositions in this vein. It's really simple to string together a bunch of dissonant chords that have no relationship to one another. So don't do that. The amount of tension within a chord can more or less be deduced by the amount of dissonant intervals it contains. Tritones, minor seconds, major sevenths, minor ninths, these create maximum tension. Perfect fourths and perfect fifths are very stable intervals, and everything else, minor and major thirds, minor and major sixths, major seconds, minor sevenths, they fall somewhere in between. With that in mind, we can calibrate the amount of dissonant intervals in each chord to see exactly how Mark played with tension and release. Since we have eight chords, let's create a scale from one to eight, with one being the most consonant chord and eight being the most dissonant. The first chord contains two major sevenths, two major sixths, a minor six, two major thirds, a major second, a perfect fifth, and a perfect fourth. Tallying up every chord in this fashion shows that measure two is the moment of most tension, while measure six is the moment of lowest tension, creating a pretty clear arc from high tension down to a release and working back up to high tension at the beginning of the cycle. Moving on, the melody to Jackie's place is almost like an etude Mark might have written to help himself clarify these challenging harmonies. You can see how the tools of bebop translate well in this context. The melody consists mainly of eighth notes, with chord tones landing on strong beats or points of rest. Chromatic passing tones play an important role of getting from A to B, in the style of the Tristano school that Turner studied so closely in his formative years. Additionally, abrupt registral shifts paired with changes in direction give the melody a frenzied vibe. Clearly, the sheer impressiveness of playing such a complicated melody in unison is a big part of the goal here. At measure 24, there's a break in the rhythm section as Kurt and Mark play an angular, unison conclusion to the previous 16 bars melody. Letter B then can be thought of as a bridge, and in this case, the term release, often used synonymously for bridge, makes a lot of sense. Whereas letter A was full of harmonic complexity, letter B consists fully of two beautiful chords, connected by perfect fifth common tones with a half step variously above or below the top note. The bass notes, D and A flat, are a tritone away, further emphasizing the primacy of this, the only interval to be repeated in the bass line thus far. The melody at letter C is so catchy. It's somewhat of a palindromic statement, beginning and ending with the same descending three note figure. That three note figure is then exploited in measures 37 to 39 over syncopated hits in the band which usher in the A section once more. So it is at this point that we discover that Jackie's Place, despite its surface level intricacy, is a fairly typical A-A-B-A form, where the A section is eight bars and the B section is 18 bars. One of my favorite parts of Jackie's Place is the surprising solely section. After Kurt solos on the A section of the tune, 
The bridge is presented with a wholly new melody, played with parallel fifths in the saxophone and the guitar. I think of this almost as a shout chorus, like something you would hear in the middle of a tune by one of Art Blakey's small groups in imitation of a shout chorus played by a big band. This shout chorus then serves as a send off for a solo over an open vamp that is comprised of the two chords of the bridge. So what at first blush seems like an intimidating tour de force is actually a fairly straightforward jazz tune. What really distinguishes it is the complexity of the harmonic framework matched with the modernistic and original melodic language. In his essay, Kevin Sun wrote that Mark's musical aesthetic had been deeply informed by the need to cope with the incredibly challenging music that his peers like Kurt Rosenwinkel, pianist Brad Meldau, and he himself were writing. According to Mark, what I'd learned, Joe Henderson and Warren Marsh and Sonny Rollins, it just wasn't working. To be more specific and give that music what it needed, it wasn't working well enough. This is why I think it's important for every improvising musician to be actively engaged in composing music. Your writing will lead you down an individual path and what the music needs will inform what you need to practice. In Mark Turner's case, spending thousands of hours of time on the road, in rehearsals, and in the practice room, dealing with tunes like Jackie's Place led him to a new way of playing. In a way, his composing during the Dharma days era can be thought of as improvising slowed down. He often seems to have written what would represent to him a flawless solo over the changes at hand. But after this formative period of his career, he shifted his priorities towards sideman work and his collective trio, Fly. He brought into all those situations what he had learned from his years systematically transcending his bebop background. With a newly minted personal language, along with the maturity and patience to focus less on shredding and more on making smart note choices. I know it was a struggle for Mark when he was younger uh, and sort of having like an identity crisis um, coming up in a in a jazz scene that's, I think, very similar to the jazz scene today in that there's a lot of focus on shredding. Well, I just want to say one thing, which is that, like, you know, we all know he can execute. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The horn, and there, but it's just the way it comes off in context, which is that it should come off as, uh, you know, purposeful and deliberate and mm -hmm. also warranted by the moment. To me, no solo demonstrates this better than his soprano saxophone solo on Sky and Country. As a composer, it's often a great idea to generate as much material as one can from just a couple really strong ideas. Although the listener might not always be aware of this kind of musical frugality, a subconscious glue is created when every part of a musical work is related. Thus, if one were to try to improvise compositionally, a great strategy would be to try to spawn each of your musical utterances from the first idea that comes out of your horn. This requires a lot, patience, a good memory, and a very good initial idea one hefty enough to produce a lot of offspring. This is exactly the strategy Mark Turner adopted for his solo on Jeff Ballard's composition, Sky and Country, from their 2008 album of the same name. The chord progression that Jeff Ballard wrote is actually quite unusual. It's a really weird chord progression too. Um, I mean, it's deceptively simple. It has the, the trappings of like a folk yeah. guitar kind mm -hmm. of a chord progression but the B to C sharp, and then the C down to G, those those two pairs of chords are like, so, could it's, almost- It's a different key, you know, the pivots. And the thing about Mark that he does work with in the trio setting is that he, he does take advantage of the fact that there's just this two voice um, melodic 
counterpoint. And so he can imply other things. Mark Turner seems to have realized that concert B is one of only two notes that works over every chord in that sequence and decided to exploit that B for all it's worth. Mark makes his intentions clear as unsubtly as possible. Three even quarter note Bs are intoned in measure eight, and then he's off to the races. Except in this case, he's more like the tortoise than the hare slow and steady. The solo almost feels like a game. How many different ways can he approach the note B? By giving that concert B so much weight via repetition, it seems to accumulate a gravitational pull that draws each melodic line into its orbit. In measure nine, the B in the upper register becomes a pedal point against which he builds an interesting counterpoint using octave displacement. The bottom pitches don't clarify the chord changes, but they do fit within them. This makes the most of the lack of a chordal instrument, creating a mystery about what the changes even are. In measure 12, Mark breaks the pedal point by shifting up a half step to C. This disturbs the gravity of the harmony enough to set into motion a series of variations. Thus, in measure 16, Mark traverses another half step higher to D flat before being pulled back to that magnetic B. In measure 19, he travels even another half step higher to D natural. Meanwhile, the rhythms have gradually begun to speed up. In measures eight to 11, the fastest unit Mark uses is an eighth note. But after introducing 16th notes in measure 12, they become a fixture until measure 21, when Mark introduces 16th note triplets. Those create a bounce that locks into the 16th note swing groove. But Mark doesn't stay there for very long. In measure 23, he begins a series of 32nd note runs that wind chromatically around the changes, like a satellite spinning chaotically only to be miraculously buoyed back into orbit as Mark intones that same high B on the downbeat of the third chorus. Here in measure 25, Mark deploys one of his favorite devices. Using that magnetic B as sort of a common tone hinge, he arpeggiates first A flat minor, then G major, then A flat minor again. Measures 25 to 28 are a steady stream of just blazing 32nd notes, but you might be surprised to hear that they were really easy to transcribe because of how clearly Mark articulates and centers each pitch. The increased rhythmic intensity is heightened, literally, as Mark climbs the third octave of the soprano saxophone's range. This is where most professionals' usable range maxes out, but I guess it shouldn't be a surprise that Mark Turner can play super high into the altissimo, even on soprano saxophone. Then in measure 32, he plays the fastest rhythmic groupings that we will hear in the entire solo. 64th notes climb chromatically to reach the downbeat of measure 33, where the chords from the bridge begin. And it's at this very moment that Mark crashes through the atmosphere and veers away from the gravitational pull of those high Bs. Mark has made it very clear in interviews that he is not a fan of the typical orgasmic shape of a jazz solo. In an interview with Ben Ratliff, he said, I'm definitely interested in pacing. You can go in and just play and let things happen the way they're going to happen, but often it can be all too easy to follow the same arc all the time, you know? It seems like recently, especially in the last 15 years, there's the golden mean arc, which I feel like train began. Start more or less kind of slow, come to the huge, go to the top of the mountain, I'm exploring every possibility, hero, sax player, and a little after two thirds you come down, and that's considered the perfect solo. I totally disagree with that. Now, this is a compositional consideration. What form will your musical material take? And Mark is totally right. Considering there are literally an infinite number of possible forms, most soloists never stray from the tried and true. In Sky and Country, Mark's solo starts at a relatively low level of intensity in terms of both pitch and rhythm. Then over the course of 24 measures, it grows in intensity and finally stays at the level of highest intensity 
for eight measures. It's important to note that Mark doesn't generate the intensity of the last eight measures by simply playing even faster. Instead, he locks into an interesting and simple rhythmic pattern, allowing the rhythm section to generate the intensity underneath him. In other words, he leads them there, and then he says, you go ahead, I'll stay here and hold down the fort. Guy in the mask playing bass. <laughs> In short, to me, Mark Turner represents the perfect melding of the composer and the improviser into one. His improvisations contain logic, patience, and experimentation. They sound like the process of composing, but sped up. Conversely, his compositions can sound like improvisation slowed down. They're organic, free, spontaneous. And those two worlds meet somewhere in the middle. Okay, Brian, this is all well and good, but how can I develop these qualities in myself? It's kind of not a nice impression of whoever that's supposed to be. Well, I don't really know, but I have some ideas. First of all, there's no way around it. You have to spend time writing music if you wanna grow that part of your musicianship. You won't learn how to improvise compositionally by just improvising a lot. You have to slow the process down and write. As you write, notice what piques your interest musically and follow that thread. Try to play with those things while you're improvising. Secondly, when you're improvising, have patience. Spend time developing one idea, like Mark did on Sky and Country, for even longer than you feel comfortable with. It might seem counterintuitive, but I can tell you when it comes to creativity, limitations will set you free. As always, thank you to my Patreon folks. You guys are the best and you make these videos possible. Thank you. We're gonna start doing live stream Q and A's and listening sessions on Patreon. So sign up and become part of the hang. It's gonna be super fun. Thanks also to Kevin Sun for his insight and to my bandmates, Ollie Hirvonen, Marty Kenny and Nathan Elman Bell. By the way, we've made some records. You should check them out. And finally, thank you for spending so much of your time with me. If there's any music that you'd like me to check out on Score Study in the future, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'll at least definitely check it out.